So this is starting an advertisement for the idea that some basic instructions in geometric group theory are useful for setting symmetries that are right So this is a uh, work in progress for Sir Thomas. So I want to start with the ping pong one, which is something classical for that the person is applying. So this is a criterion for telling when some group G splits into three product of some subgroups that generate it. And uh, let me give this statement. So I have some group G, I have a bunch of subgroups that generate it. I'd like to know when does G split as a free product. And the criterion is I need G to act on some set X, and I need some subsets indexed in the same way as the subgroups, and I need some point that's off of the union of all of them. So that non trivial elements of the group GI send all the other sets together with the point into its own subset. And when this happens, the natural map, which is the surjection because these groups generate, is actually injected. So I get an extra part of the okay. So I want to do an example, uh, which is picturesque. So I'm going to start out with the group PSL2 set. It has these standard generators. They act on a perhaps lane in a neutral way. So x times z to minus 1 over z. t times z to z plus 1. And I'm interested in this subgroup of the SLQ that is generated by these three elements. So conjugates of that. The claim is this first splits into three sides. So I want to use this uh, lemma here to prove this. So I've got to give you some set X on which the group acts. That's just going to be the upper half line. I need to give you some subsets that are moved around under these subgroups in the appropriate way. So the picture is this. At the upper half line, here I have this uh, half disk of radius 1. And S, which sends Z to minus 1 over Z, sends everything outside the disk in, everything inside the disk out. So this is going to be X naught. This is going to correspond to S. Okay. I'll just take some point out here. And because T is just a translation, these conjugated subgroups are going to say T as T inverse and send everything outside this disk and everything in out. Okay. So there are the subsets that you need in the statement of the ping pong lemma. So for any non-trivial element of one of these groups, it sends everything else into the subset. Okay, so this shows that the set, this group G generated by these three things actually splits as a free product. So this here is a free coxeter group, which means that each of the generators is in evolution and there are no further relations. Okay, so keep this example in mind. This has something to do with exceptional vector models. Okay. So uh, I'll briefly talk some things about exceptional collection. So an object in some alienary triangulated categories, so A is a field. This is called an exceptional if the X algebra is as simple as possible. So they are just scalar endomorphisms and no higher or lower X. Then an exceptional collection is a bunch of exceptional objects ordered in such a way that there are no X going backwards. An exceptional collection is called cool if it generates D. So there should be an equal D there. Meaning I can build every object in D from the EI using the standard operations. I can take sums, I can take shifts, I can take maps between them, I can take cones of those maps, and so on. So reasons you might be interested in full exceptional collections, it gives you a way to represent your category as modules over some differential graded algebra, which is a derived endomorphisms of the sum of these things. And it also gives a thing where we're talking about decomposition of the category, which is often related to, say, if D is coherent, or a category coherent cube, this is often related to decompositions of the classical motive of your variety. So, standard example, uh, the category is bounded by a category coherent cube on Pn. I have this standard collection, O, O, one up to ON. It's easy to check just using cohomology of line models that this is an exceptional collection. You can show that it generates using a resolution of the diagonal due to Bamson. It's also a dual collection in terms of which powers of the uh, cotangent bundle together with this. Okay. So keep this example in mind. 
So given uh, one full exceptional collection, you can mutate it to get lots of others. So reasons you might like to do this. Uh, my original motivation for looking at this was uh, twofold. So one, uh, I would like to understand certain spaces and stability conditions associated with varieties with full exceptional collections. And a single ex full exceptional collection gives you some open subsets in the space of stability conditions. You like to get lots of open subsets and like to know how they're connected to each other. So for this, you need to understand some mutation operation on these collections. Uh, second is, this is about to be useful for understanding uh, groups of auto occurrences of some Flavial varieties that are associated to the variety you start with. Okay? So this is the comment here. And um, this mutation operation is a local operation, so you first define it on pairs. So I have an exceptional pair. These are exceptional objects, no x going back. I build a new exceptional pair called the left mutation. So I move the object E up. I move F down together with some kind of twist. And this twist is defined as I take derived homomorphisms from E to F. I apply them to E, I get to F. <coughs> and I take this cofounder, homotopy fiber. So you can check that this again gives a new exceptional pair. And now I can use this um, operation to work locally on a longer collection. So the operation mu i is going to mutate the exceptional pair here. There's also an inverse operation, the right mutation. So it's actually an invertible operation. And you can check that the mu i satisfies braid relations. So it turns out there's an action of the braid group on n plus one strands <coughs> and exceptional collections of n plus one. So this is the action we're going to be interested in understanding. So uh, the setting I want to work in is for minimal phono varieties. So these, this is where the first case you should treat because then we get the strongest result. So minimal means it's minimal in the sense of k-naught. So the rank of k-naught is as small as possible. I mean, in general, k-naught can be huge, right? It doesn't even have to be counted to be generated. Uh, but this happens, for instance, for projective space, for odd dimensional quadrics, for some special quantum threefolds, and so on. <coughs> so, and this, this is a nice case because you know, in this case, uh, that mutation of a full exceptional collection of vector models again consists of vector models. This is not true in general. So, for fin minimal quantum of dimension mm -hmm. less than four, it's known that the break group action on full exceptional collections of vector models is actually transitive. So you have some favorite exceptional collection that you start with, and you can build all other ones from that. So in terms of, say, some space stability conditions, I'm kind of giving you uh, a very large uh, connected uh, piece of the space stability conditions. So uh, examples of this, P1, this is not hard at all. Uh, it goes back probably to Isaac Newton. Uh, P2. This is non-trivial. This goes to back to Gordon and Nancy Rudolfo in 87. So uh, these, of course, are different centuries. <laughs> and P3 and other minimal final threefolds. So this is hard work. You actually have to do. Yeah, I mean the idea is not so difficult, but to carry it out takes some work. So there's a numerical part related to some Markov type equations. This was worked out by Nogan in 94 goes on for about 50 pages, case by case. And then Polishuk did um, the geometry necessary to lift this numerical work to the state if you want. All right, so in higher dimensions, the transitivity of this break group action is open even for people. And as far as I know, the question of freeness of this group action has only been addressed for P2 by Bridgeland in his paper on the structure of the local body algorithm. So the, the previous question is very interesting if you're trying to uh, describe certain spaces. Right. So the strategy that I want to describe for freeness and transitivity is the following. So I'm going to find some set F on which I already know that the gray group acts really intransitively. And then I'm going to construct a map from full exceptional collections, say vector bundles, to that set S. And I'm going to sh see that this is equivariant. So that will show right away, because the target has a free action, that the source also has to have a free action. Um, and then you do a little more work to get transitivity from this. 
So the set I'm going to use S is going to be certain n plus one tuples of group elements. And there's a classical behavior action on n plus one tuples of group elements that looks a lot like the mutation for exceptional collections. So this is due to Hurwitz. He studied this. He used this action in his study of um, ramified coverings of Riemann surfaces. And the important sort of input or inspiration for this strategy was the theorem of the seats in geometric group theory, which says that if F is a free or free coxeter group on X naught through Xn, then this Hurwitz action is actually free and transitive on good factorizations of this special element. Okay? So the special element, if you're working with the free group as the fundamental group of some punctured disk, then the special element is just going all the way around and coming back. Okay. And you can, in this case, interpret the service action in terms of the mapping class group action uh, on this disk. Okay. So the set F that we're going to use is going to be the factorization of C, which we know that the break group action there is free and So given a minimal Fano variety, and uh, with a full exceptional collection of vector bundles, uh, I have to tell you how to get the map to the set F, uh, S. So we're going to associate to the variety the certainty group together with this Euler form. Because I have a full exceptional collection of vector bundles, you can check the Euler form is actually upper triangular with respect to that basis. That's just the condition that there's no X going backwards. And in order to get some sort of more geometry into the situation, we're going to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize k naught in, in its other form. So this is going to give us some kind of lattice. Geometrically, this corresponds to uh, passing to some Calabial double cover of your final variety and looking at the numerical certainty group there. So to each of the objects in our full exceptional collection, we're going to associate a symmetry. Uh, so this is going to be some projective linear transformation of L. It's given just by a kind of reflection formula. So geometrically on the double cover of L, this is going to correspond to a spherical twist along this object EI. It actually becomes a spherical object on the double cover. So in, if we're in even dimensions, this is actually a reflection. And if we're in odd dimensions, this will be a transaction. Why do you Um. Because I'm lazy and I don't want to worry about time. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't have to do PGL, but it's sufficient. Okay. So given this data, you can check you actually get a factorization. If I multiply these all in order, I get a factorization of kappa, where kappa is the action of this air cluster. So altogether, what we get is a map from full exceptional collections of vector bundles to factorizations of kappa. And I would like this to be my set S, which was factorization with a special element in a free group or a free coxeter group. Okay. Uh, furthermore, this is great equivariant, where here I have the mutation operation and here I have the Hurwitz action. And our theorem is that if I have a minimal Fano variety with a full exceptional collection of vector bundles, such that so I need some condition that I can sometimes check. So first, uh, I want EI to be the unique exceptional vector bundle in its k naught class. This is true for those examples A, say for the example O through ON on projective space. Uh, it's also true for standard collections on odd dimensional quadrants. And second, so this is this is not hard to achieve. The second condition is a little harder. So I want this group generated by these reflections or transactions to be free or free possible. So if I have both of these, then the break group action is free and transitive <coughs> on full exceptional collections of vector bundles. So here I'm applying the theorem of the cease to say that the action is free and transitive here. So this is related to transitivity and this is more related to freedom. So some remarks. Uh, this first hypothesis about K-naught for lots of examples is no problem. And the second, that you have some free or free coxeter group is more work in higher dimensions. But in low dimensions, it's actually easy to check by hand. So the hypotheses, uh, both hypotheses, 
are satisfied, at least for minimal quantum varieties, to dimension less than four. So uh, our theorem recovers really without sweat all of the known uh, examples of transitivity and also gives freeness. And uh, we have a, a general strategy for trying to prove freeness or free fox uh for PN and also for odd dimensional pleasure. And I hope any day now we'll be done working that out. Okay? So let me show you an example, which is why uh, I did this picture. So I could do P3, which would be more impressive, but also uh, the picture's not as nice. So let me just do P2. Um, so here, our lattice is rank 3. Um, <coughs> I have a full exceptional collection of rank 3. I symmetrize the form. So I have a quadratic form. It turns out I have a signature of 1, 2. Anytime you're in this sort of situation, you have associated to it a period in there. So if you're familiar with, say, moduli of K3 surfaces, you're used to this is the usual period domain construction. And in this case, uh, this actually can be naturally identified with the upper half plane. And so I can look at my symmetries of this projective space. So I'll respect the period domain, and I can see how they act on the upper half planes. So I'm going to consider this full exceptional collection, because it's symmetric looking in this picture. And under this identification of upper half plane with the period domain, these reflections, you can check, act as these transformations that I wrote down. So at the very beginning of the talk, I argued that that was indeed a free coxeter group. So by this picture, we have a free coxeter group, and by our theorem, this proves uh, that the very group action and fully acceptable question is equitable from P2 is free and transit. So you can do this uh, all the way through dimension three. There's some more arguments. Okay, so final remarks. Um, on quadrial hypersurfaces and double coverers, a similar argument using a somewhat more complicated breaker should show that the group of auto equivalences contains some free product like this. This was the original problem I was interested in. And you can actually, I'm almost done showing this, I believe, for quartic and double sex at K3s. And knowing this is almost enough to establish Grudelin's conjecture on spaces of stability conditions. So uh, I've been working on this with Daniel Herbrex and Amani Wittemachri. So this is really where, where I started and then ended up with this other problem with you. <coughs> uh, like I said, I think of this as an advertisement that very basic ideas like the ping pong line uh, from geometric group theory can be very useful in studying symmetries of direct categories. So I'll stop there. Because 